Okay, members, it's uh, time for questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, and I call Robin Newton to ask the first question. Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number one, Minister. I can confirm that, subject to the necessary funding being available, Northern Ireland Water does intend to replace the Sydenham Wastewater Pumping Station. Northern Ireland Water has reached agreement in principle with Belfast City Council on the preferred location of the replacement facility, and I have been advised that environmental modelling and design development to deliver the best engineering solution is currently underway. Geotechnical investigations completed in March 2020 are informing the design and will help establish the most suitable construction method. Completion of the outline design, along with planning and other approvals, is expected in the summer of 2022, followed by the procurement and award of the contract in autumn 2023. It is hoped that construction will commence in the spring of 2024, with completion of construction, testing and commissioning in autumn 2026. I must stress these dates are dependent on the outcome of ongoing environmental modelling, obtaining the necessary statutory approvals and the availability of funding to deliver the project. The current estimate for the investment needed to replace the pumping station is around £32 million, which is included in Northern Ireland Water's overall PC21 business plan for the six-year period from 2021 to 27. The replacement of this pumping station is part of the Living with Water programme, which is a 12-year drainage and wastewater plan for the Greater Belfast area, costing in the region of £1.4 billion. In line with the Executive's New Decade New Approach priorities, I will be making a strong case for this pumping station scheme, along with the wider Living with Water programme to be funded. Robin Newton, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for her, her reply. Uh, the Minister will be aware that this has been a problem over quite a number of years, and in fact, on two occasions, seven or eight, nine houses were completely flooded out with raw sewerage on two separate occasions. In addition to that, those who live directly opposite in a street, residential area, live in the shadow of, of, of the building. Can I ask the Minister, five years is a long time to wait with that potential flooding uh, in the back of your mind, or indeed uh, an, an inappropriate the sited facility directly opposite your house. Can the Minister try, as best she possibly can, to accelerate the programme beyond the current five-year timescale, as, as, as she has just outlined? I thank the member for his question, um, uh, and I appreciate how concerning this is for residents and, and for you as her elected representative. And the outcome of the recently completed drainage area study of the area served by this pumping station highlighted the need for a further environmental modelling study to assess the effects of outflows from the station on the Cons Water uh, River. Um, this study is ongoing, but it will take time to complete. But I give the member my assurance that I will make sure that my officials do what they can, working with Northern Ireland Water to accelerate this important, important work. Well, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Having spent uh, New Year's Eve volunteering with the Red Cross delivering sandbags to the people of Sydenham, I am acutely aware of the extent of the problem in the area. And can I add my voice to asking that the scheme is expedited as quickly as possible and ask how positive the scheme will be when it is completed for the area? I thank the member for his question, and it will make a huge difference um, to residents living in the area. Uh, and as I said to Mr. Newton, we will do what we can to accelerate. And I also want to assure your constituents that Northern Ireland Water will carry out a programme of consultation with the local communities affected by the proposals in advance of construction. Uh, so they will be involved in that, and I will ensure that they are kept fully updated as well. Lord Kelly. Um, thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the Living with Water programme? Uh, Living with Water in Belfast and Integrated Plan for Drainage and Wastewater Management in Greater Belfast was published for consultation on the 11th of November and closed on the 29th of January 2021. Officials are currently considering the responses received and will prepare a consultation report which will be taken into account when drafting the final plan. 
The draft plan indicates that approximately £1.4 billion of investment is needed over the next 12 years to upgrade the drainage and wastewater infrastructure in the Greater Belfast area to protect against flooding, enhance the water environment and facilitate growth. The focus of the programme is on developing integrated catchment-based solutions to manage rainwater on the surface and where possible, avoid hard engineered drainage solutions which involve long-term operating and maintenance costs. It is my intention to bring the final plan to the Executive for approval in the coming weeks. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister, can I ask you for an update on um, what steps your department has taken to adopt the Ravensbray wastewater treatment plant in Garrison. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, and she will be aware that Northern Ireland Water have been trying to be helpful in this situation. The difficulty here is that it is an unadopted uh, area, so is out with the statutory responsibilities of Northern Ireland Water. Um, although I am keen to try to see where we can be further supportive, so I understand there's detailed work ongoing to understand exactly what work would be required um, and costings. And I've asked my officials to continue to work constructively with local residents to see what we may be able to do, even within all of the restrictions to, to help and assist in this very, very difficult situation for the residents. Thank you very much. Uh, question number two, Mr. Figger. The new decade and your approach agreement commits the executive to tackling climate change and to addressing its immediate and longer term impacts and to create legislation and targets for reducing carbon emissions. In my tenure as Minister for Infrastructure, I have taken forward several projects which will help to mitigate the climate emergency and ensure Northern Ireland has adapted to the impacts of climate change. These include a range of initiatives to facilitate modal shift to more sustainable travel options, including investment in new and existing cycleways, working with councils to deliver sustainable local transport plans. £30 million pounds of investment in low emission buses for TransLink and £66 million pounds investment in low and zero emission buses for TransLink and investment in excess of £60 million pounds to purchase new train carriages and to encourage more people out of their cars and onto rail. I have also invested £20 million in a blue-green infrastructure fund to make public transport and active travel a more attractive and efficient alternative to the use of private cars. As we have just been discussing, I have also brought forward the Living with Water programme, which will revolutionise the way drainage and wastewater uh, is managed to prevent flooding caused by climate change. And I also appreciate the role that tree planting can play in mitigating against climate change and the multiple benefits that woodland creation can provide for society. Um, I am also rolling out LED lights right across uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, this work has resulted in a significant reduction in energy consumption um, by about 24 per cent, and it is my intention to make further allocations towards LED retrofitting in 2021-22. Uh, to date, through the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund, I have allocated £3.7 million of capital for greenway projects, and I remain committed to doing what I can, working with councils and local communities, so that we all play our part in tackling the climate emergency. Colin McGrath, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. It is obvious that you are making real progress in tackling the climate crisis, and we in South Down want to be able to play our part in that. Many people have contacted me, for example, and I know this isn't your direct responsibility, about e car charging points, which they would like to see more of in the community. But would the Minister commit to meeting with me so that we could discuss ways that uh, the community could respond and assist in being able to tackle the shared ambition of? of tackling the climate crisis. I thank the member for his question, um, and he raises a very important point. As he rightly highlights, the eCar public charge point network in Northern Ireland is owned, operated, and maintained by ESB. I have recently met with ESB and representatives from the motor industry to identify further opportunities for collaboration to advance the e-charging network to play its part in tackling the climate crisis. My officials are also assisting ESB as it seeks to replace up to 60 charge points, um, uh, which were installed as far back as 2011 2012 and are now experiencing faults. Uh, members will know that I have also made changes to the planning system through permitted development rights to make it easier to install uh, e charging infrastructure. I am also pleased that my department has been able to provide funding. 
uh, to the EU Interreg Funded Faster project, uh, which will see a number of charging points put across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, of course, my department has also been leading a transport working group to uh, inform the elements of the energy strategy for Northern Ireland, and a key part of this work is involving the electrification of vehicles. The Minister has kind of answered the question, but just, Minister, you know that the network itself, the electric charge network, is worsening and we definitely need to upgrade it. But can you clarify whether or not you are going to support the ESB in terms of funding to, one, repair that network and to upgrade it for the future? Because it is important that we encourage people into electric vehicles going in the market. I thank the member for his question. Um, as I said, I have met with ESB. Um, my department is working with them on retrofitting, but you are absolutely right. We need to be improving and expanding the e-charging network and people's ability to be able to charge their vehicles at home. Uh, so my officials have been working with the uh, Office for Zero Emission Vehicles um, because they have funding there, and we are working with councils as well to enable that to be drawn down. Um, I have also, as I said, met recently with representatives of the motor industry as well, and as we discussed, affordability is a barrier, but also um, is anxiety around range. Uh, and so I will continue to work with the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles. I have also written to the British Government as well, asking them to identify what funding is available in Northern Ireland so that we can meet our targets. And so I remain very much committed to doing much more in this area, working with all of the relevant partners. Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for, for her update. To date, NI Direct records 337 electric charging points across Northern Ireland. Anecdotally, I have been told up to half are not working at any given time. Could the minister confirm that, and, and also that there don't appear to be any in Strangford constituency? Um, the member is correct to identify that there is an issue with um, uh, faulty e-charging points. The difficulty here is that they were installed many years back. That is why I am pleased that my department is working with ESB to retrofit a number of those. Um, but we also need to provide additional uh, e-charging infrastructure. And a key part of this going forward will be enabling people to charge their vehicles overnight at home. Uh, and so that is why I am continuing to work with uh, ministers in, in London as well to make sure that we can draw down the maximum amount of funding, working with local councils as well, so that we can improve the e-charging infrastructure and that we can have charging points in the members' constituency. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses to date about what is an important issue. Uh, I think the e-charging network, I think it would be fair to say that that network is currently a shambles. The Department also has 1,283 staff car parking spaces, with only two e-charging spa car parking spaces. Will the Minister commit to do what our counterpart has done down south, which is rebalancing our budget towards the priorities which will tackle climate change, such as e-cars, active travel and public transport? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. And uh, as I've stated in the responses to other members, you know, I have made a number of changes to improve the charging uh, infrastructure, whether it's through the retrofitting or changing to the planning system itself. And as I said, I'm also working with a range of partners to identify funding. I've also uh, established for the first time a £20 million blue-green infrastructure fund to achieve the very outcomes that the member has highlighted. So I've asked officials to look to see what we can do in the particular area of e-charging infrastructure and what financial support my department may be able to play. Um, but I have also recently met with Minister Putz on this issue, and I am keen to meet with um, the Economy Minister as well, because I think that we need to be working right across our departments and situating this very much in an executive-led approach to tackling the climate emergency. I call Steve Egan. Uh, number three, Mr. Speaker, please. Um, the Department has not started a review into the future of Northern Ireland Water. Northern Ireland Water was established in 2007 and today holds dual status as a government-owned company and as a non-departmental public body. Since formation, Northern Ireland Water has significantly improved the delivery of water and sewage services in Northern Ireland. Throughout the most recent regulatory price control, PC15, Northern Ireland Water has consistently exceeded the levels of service and efficiency required by the utility regulator. Northern Ireland Water now makes recurring annual savings of around £65 million as compared to the legacy water service pre-2007. When compared to the most efficient water and sewage companies in England and Wales, Northern Ireland Water has closed the efficiency gap from 49% in 2007-08 to within 7% today. 
Given these achievements, I see no clear benefit to review the future of Northern Ireland water. What I have done and what I will continue to do is to present the argument for sufficient public funding for Northern Ireland water to my executive colleagues. I recognise that modern, well-maintained and sufficiently funded sustainable water and wastewater is essential to deliver economic growth, address regional imbalance and tackle the climate emergency. Vacant, supplementary. Thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Minister indeed for her replies so far. Uh, at the Finance Committee recently, we were hearing discussions about, particularly about Northern Ireland Water and the future funding mechanisms. And indeed, in questions already you gave today to the Assembly, you realise that there's some in the region about 1.5 billion that is required, even as an interim, to be able to make Belfast wastewater requirements. Never mind the rest of Northern Ireland. So, bearing in mind that is the case, what would you be in favour of? Would you be in favour of mutualisation, bringing in of water charges? or some other hybrid model, because, quite frankly, it is unsustainable and Northern Ireland water is not going to be able to continue as it is. My position, and it is shared by the Executive, uh, is that Northern Ireland water should be publicly owned. I therefore continue to make the case uh, that we need to ensure that it has then sufficient public funds um, to fulfil that um, position and desire of the executive for it to be public owned. So I will continue to make the case for, um, for funding at the executive table. But I want to be absolutely clear, I as Minister for Infrastructure do not support the introduction of water charges. I call Carly Killen. Good count, Carly, and thank the Minister. For her responses. She has mentioned live, the Living with Water programme a few times um, and acknowledged that it is largely uh, a programme for Greater Belfast. Could I ask the Minister what her department is doing and to ensure that there is regional imbalance, particularly for areas who need an upgrading water uh, and waste, please? Yeah. I thank the member for her question. Um, and as well as the Living with Water uh, in Belfast piece of work, we are also engaging in a study in Derry as well. My officials are um, finalising the considerations of that report, and then I will use that to be identifying the next steps forward. The reality is, because we have had historic underinvestment in our water and wastewater infrastructure, we now have over 100 locations that are either at or beyond developmental capacity. So this is not just an issue uh, affecting Belfast; it is an issue affecting, I would argue, nearly every constituency that members represent across this house. Again, I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Really, it was um, further to the minister's last response in terms of the impact right across the north. I already know in my own constituency that planning applications have been uh, refused or put on hold because of the lack of capacity, particularly within sewage. And I know the minister, time and time again, has made a call for greater investment by the executive in water and sewage infrastructure. Can the minister outline uh, right across the north the impact that this lack of investment has, is having? Yeah, as, as the member rightly highlights, the historic underfunding of Northern Ireland Water is now manifesting itself through a growing number of areas where there are now development constraints. As I said, there are currently over 100 such areas, with a further 37 under stress. Um, and I believe, and it is the responsibility of this executive to address this constrained funding for our public services. Uh, we have to be absolutely honest and real. If we do not address the water and wastewater infrastructure difficulties, then we will not be able to build the many new homes that we need. We will not be able to have the economic growth that our citizens deserve. And so it's absolutely fundamental if we, as an executive, are to deliver on our programme for government that we realise the investment required in our water and wastewater infrastructure right across the North. I call Kelly Armstrong. Four. Um, I would hope that all Assembly members are well aware that my department's resource budget presents an ongoing challenge for the delivery of its statutory duties. This financial year continues to be very challenging, and when inflationary pay and price pressures are taken into account, it is effectively a real terms cut. Members may also be aware that the increase of only 3 per cent on the 2020-21 opening position has been specifically attributed to Northern Ireland Water. This means that there is little to no flexibility within my resource funding to rebalance towards anything else other than to focus on delivering statutory and other essential duties. However, I am committed to investing in active travel, as we have to address the issues of how we travel if we are to deal with the challenges we face in respect of health and wellbeing in the climate emergency. 
Last year, I announced a £20 million capital blue-green infrastructure fund, and I am committed to delivering a similar level of capital funding this year. However, in addition to that, I am looking at opportunities within the constraints I am operating within to fund activities from the resource budget. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I agree with you that it is part of your essential duties to consider climate change, and one of the ways that we can do that is through active travel. You have mentioned the £20 million capital money, but that is significantly less than 5 per cent of your total capital budget. How can we hope to move forward the uh, blue-green um, change to the way that we travel unless it is funded appropriately? And Can you increase the number of or the amount of funding available for this blue-green fund through other capital options? I thank the member for her question. And there is a responsibility on all of us, whether they are ministers or uh, as citizens in our society, to be paying our part in climate action. I obviously would like to be able to do so much more, but I have to operate within the funding envelope that I have been given. Uh, so I remain committed to doing what I can within those financial constraints um, when it comes to climate action. That is why my intention is to roll on the £20 million Blue Green Fund. And as I have said, I am working now with my officials through very difficult scenarios on the resource side to see what we may be able to do there. The reality is, if every time I go to do something more or new, I have to then look at stopping something that the department is already carrying out. And as members will know, the role of my department is so operational and impacts on everybody's life that that throws up very difficult uh, scenarios. So it is a very difficult balancing act, but I am committed to doing what I can. I think it's been demonstrated in the Blue Green Fund, um, and I would hope that Councils have been continuing to develop their proposals so that I am in a position to be able to financially support many more projects in this financial year. Call Philip McGuigan. I can call you and I thank the Minister uh, for her answer and acknowledge the, the ambition that she has shown. But she will be aware that her department has recently taken some criticism on relation to slow progress on active travel measures, particularly when it comes to progressing cycling only infrastructure. Uh, just given, meaning she, and she has outlined it herself, the economic, environmental, and health benefits uh, of active travel, can I ask the Minister if she is considering introducing uh, an active travel bill that would help put active travel? on a statutory fitting. Um, I thank the member for raising his question. Um, this was something that I would have been very keen to do and actually in taking up post had asked officials to look into it. Uh, the reality now that given the impact of the pandemic and the impact that that had on the work of the department, combined with a very limited amount of time left in this mandate, it is not going to be possible to be able to bring forward primary legislation. So what I have uh, asked officials to do then is to look to see about changing the culture in my department. Um, it's also about uh, changing the policy focus uh, and changing kind of the areas that we invest in. Um, so we're trying to do that piece of work uh, and advance all of that change where we can. But I would hope that my successor, um, whoever that is, um, continues on in this vein and would give very positive consideration to bringing forward an active travel bill because I think it would be hugely beneficial. Call Jocelyn McNulty. My yogurt can call it. Minister, it's one thing getting your picture taken po pointing into potholes. It's another matter for the Sinn Féin Finance Minister altogether to pony up to pay for their repair. Everyone knows the Sinn Féin Minister holds the, the purse strings. With your resource budget effectively being a real terms cut uh, to, the finance, to the infrastructure minister, you have a very difficult job balancing comp competing priorities. Have you asked the Sinn Féin Finance Minister for more money for these priorities and for the repair of potholes? I thank the member for his question. Um, as I outlined in a previous response, the Department's resource outcome is very disappointing. I mean, that's there for all to see. Um, the budget outcome is such that not all of even our most high priority or inescapable pressures have been met by a significant margin. And following success of reducing budgets, the Department has emphasised the extent that further budget reductions cannot be found without having an impact on public services, including public transport and road maintenance. Um, I have, of course, made the Finance Minister and Executive colleagues aware of these pressures. Um, while I bid for additional money on the Department's £62 million of COVID pressures, um, I received an allocation of £20 million. Um, should the remaining pressures not be met in year, this is likely to impact on the essential services that the Department delivers. But I will continue to stress the real pressures for our key service and will bid in year, as I did last year, to improve our services for citizens. Uh, can we bring Karen Mullen on screen, please? Uh, 
Yep. Question number five, Minister. I am ambitious for our rail network and I am keen to do all that I can to explore how we progress rail improvements within the limited budgetary envelope that, we have, uh, made, that has been made available to us. I also want to ensure that any proposals for changes to the rail network include operational and financial viability and have a clear focus on the part that rail can play in growing the all-island economy, improving the ability of people to connect with and access opportunities and addressing regional imbalance. I do believe that rail has huge untapped potential to deliver multiple benefits across our island, and I am committed to addressing regional imbalance by improving connectivity to the northwest area. In line with this, I have commissioned a feasibility study to get Phase 3 of the Coleraine to Derry project back on track. I have also commissioned additional studies to explore the possibility of a half-hourly service from Derry to Belfast, as well as providing additional halts at Ballykelly, Strathfoyle and City of Derry Airport. Work on the Phase 3 feasibility study is ongoing with a number of topographical and pilot studies underway um, and I continue to work with the, the campaign group into the West as we advance that work and keep it moving forward. Rail is absolutely key to the future of travel on our island and I will continue to do all that I can to enhance opportunities, particularly for communities that have been left behind for too long. Supplementary Carmel. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you for that update. Clearly, investment is needed in the dairy to coal coal rain uh, railway line. Can I can I ask the minister also to give me an update on the active travel centre that is meant to be part of the Northwest Transport Hub? I understand that your department has made an application to SEUPB for funding. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm very keen to increase the proportion of everyday journeys made by walking, cycling and public transport um, right across uh, the north. Um, enhanced passenger facilities opened in November last year um, in the North West Transport Hub with the completion of the main station work along with a new 100 space park and ride um, facility. Um, my department, as you say, has submitted an application for funding of the Active and Sustainable Travel Centre from the Interreg programme to the Special European Un Union programmes. Um, SEUPP has advised this request for funding is still under consideration, and my officials continue to make contact in the hope that we can get this matter positively resolved. Well, Gary Middleton. Can I thank the Minister for her responses so far? Uh, the Minister will be aware that it is important that we improve rail connectivity to the North West. Uh, Council recently approved a motion to seek your backing for a feasibility study into the Londonderry to port it down rail line and to restore that. Uh, would the, is that something the Minister is actively going to support? I thank the member for his question, and, and I have announced a number of feasibility studies in terms of improving connectivity um, into the North West. I have also uh, agreed to part fund a feasibility study into the railway line from Portadown to Armagh. I suppose the difficulty that I have now is I have received multiple requests for individual feasibility studies, and the member will know that um, I am working on a regional strategic transport plan. And I think it is very important that we take a strategic approach to this. So that is going to go out for consultation later this year and I would encourage members in the North West to be making representations about rail lines and what they would like to see in that and the member will also know that we have launched the All Island Strategic Rail Review as well which will look at rail connectivity right across the island and will be data led as well so there is a lot of opportunity here for people to be feeding in and to be shaping it and I believe to be dramatically improving our rail infrastructure. Daniel McCrossan. Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answers to your questions so far. Uh, Minister, I know you will agree our late colleague John Dallet is very proud of uh, the huge amount of work and focus and attention you have put on uh, investing in rail and the various reviews you have got on. He has been a champion of this all his uh, uh, life and, and public life in particular. So, Minister, with that said, you have mentioned the review. What would the benefits of that strategic rail review be for the North West? I thank the member for his question. And, um, last month I was delighted to announce, along with Minister Ryan, the launch of the Strategic All-Island Rail Review. And that will explore the opportunities to better connect communities in the North West, yes, 
but much further afield um, as well, and will open up opportunities for our island economy. Um, since coming into office, I have been clear that it is my priority to address regional imbalance, tackle the climate crisis, and better connect communities across Ireland. So this review will allow us to consider the rail network across this island and how we can improve it. And I look forward to working with colleagues north and south as we maximise the opportunities from rail in particular to transform travel and opportunities for our citizens who share this island. As I said, the purpose of this review will be to allow data to drive how we improve and expand our rail connections. This process is at an early stage with a procurement exercise on, uh, being undertaken to appoint a service provider to deliver the review. And that ends the period for a list of questions. And I call mm -hmm. Mr. Trevor Clark. Mr. Speaker, um, can I ask uh, the Minister in relation to the, the infrastructure in terms of the roads? Um, one of the visual things that many people will see driving along is the state of the roads. We have just come out of this last year in terms of the pandemic, but in, uh, in terms of the potholes and the road repairs, they seem to be actually getting much worse. Has the Minister any plans to get additional money to bring the roads up to some form of a better standard than they currently are? <coughs> I thank the member for his question. And what we are seeing manifest is uh, years of underinvestment in our road network. Uh, the independent Barton report um, identified that there is a requirement of investment of £143 million per annum just to maintain the structural integrity uh, of our roads. Um, and so the fact that we aren't investing that amount of money is manifesting itself in potholes and a deterioration in the road network. Um, I put a bid in uh, as part of the budget process for £120 million pounds for structural maintenance. And I recognise that this is a difficulty and it's one of huge frustrations to people right across Northern Ireland. Uh, so I will continue to do what I can within the financial constraints to ensure that we are trying to uh, fix our, our road network. Because, as I said before in this House, um, if you don't do the basics right, then people find it very difficult to have confidence in us as an executive. So, you know, I remain committed to trying to do what I can, but I have to be honest as well about the financial difficulties that my department is experiencing, given the level of investment that is required in the road network. Trevor Clark, supplementary. Minister, for that, and I accept that. I mean, there has always been a, a, a concern about underinvestment in the roads, but given now that it seems that actually the repairs are actually repairing the potholes that were repaired previously, um, and there's, there's safety concerns where people are driving roads. I mean, there's these arbitrary figures in terms of the depth of these. Whilst in main roads, what we're witnessing now, people are swerving on the roads to try and avoid the roads because they're in such a bad state, which actually also feeds into road safety and indeed the dangers that comes with that. And we all are aware in, in terms of, obviously, people can put in claims uh, to road service, but, we're, but we, we know in our own constituencies where we see, in particular areas, multiple, multiple damage to vehicles, which in essence is going to be a passed on as a cost to your department. So what piece of work can you do in the short term to find out where the biggest problem areas are and address those in the meantime until the additional investment is found? Member for his question. So the department has a, a matrix and it has a framework within which it operates in terms of ensuring that there is a consistent approach right across Northern Ireland, and that is priority led. So the worst defects get uh, the quickest amount of attention. But this comes back to the fundamental problem of insufficient funding. Um, as I said, the Barton report identified a requirement of £143 million pound just to maintain the structural integrity. Uh, there has not been that level of funding for many, many years. So the difficulty that my department finds itself in is trying to carry out the work that we know is required without having the funds to be able to do it. But I will continue to make the case around the executive table to ensure that we can get the funding that is required so that we can find a way of dealing with this, because patching you know, may work in the first instance, but it's not the most cost-effective uh, approach in the longer term, and I recognise that. Next two members are not in their place, and I now call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. You caught me off guard there. Uh, thanks, Minister, for the answer to your question so far. Minister, today you have announced the consultation uh, in relation to the heavy goods vehicles uh, that are going through Claddy Village in the heart of my constituency. Recently, consti uh, constituents have met with you and have expressed uh, huge concern. And, and, uh, and to your credit, Minister, you have responded uh, to their calls for help. Uh, Minister, could you give us an update as to what happens next? I know the member uh, and his um, colleague, Councillor Edwards, have been um, very much campaigning on this issue, and I want to thank them for giving me the opportunity to meet with residents directly to hear of their concerns and how this is, um, issue is impacting on them. 
As a member will know, the public consultation in 2019 attracted a number of objections from local businesses, which would be adversely affected by the weight restriction, and this exemption is intended to reduce this impact. The legislation would prohibit vehicles exceeding 7.5 tonnes from using the B85 road in Claudie from its junction with the Bells Park Road to its junction with the Ernie Road. Under the current proposal, there will be exceptions for vehicles from the weight restriction operating from within the immediate rural catchment and for vehicles delivering or collecting from properties. The scheme could be introduced later this year, depending on the outcome of the consultation. And I would encourage everyone locally to share their views in this very short consultation. I thank the Minister for that answer and for her firm commitment to the people of Claddy that she is um, uh, dedicated to resolving this uh, issue. Uh, the Minister will be aware that Claddy is a very small rural village. It is a very narrow street and there are cars parked outside people's residential homes. Uh, and when heavy duty lorries come through or heavy goods lorries come through to access Donegal, uh, they're blocking this village, causing considerable issues. Uh, will the Minister uh, uh, again reaffirm her support uh, to resolving this issue uh, and, and give a commitment to this House and to the people of Claddy that she'll do everything within her grasp to see this resolved as swiftly as possible? Thank you. I do recognise uh, the importance of this issue and you know, I listened to residents you know, whose homes have been damaged. Um, because of um, the vehicles, huge vehicles passing by their homes. Um, we had to go out to consult on this issue, um, and the consultation is a short period. It opens on the 26th of May and it closes on the 18th of June. So I would encourage the member uh, and his constituents to respond positively to that consultation. Uh, and I reiterate the commitment that I gave to the residents when I met with them to do what we can to move this forward as quickly as possible, because it has been an issue that has been around for quite some time. Again, I call Dagna Magalier. Um, uh, uh, Ken uh, I just want to uh, go back to the topic of potholes, which was raised previously. And the, member will, the minister will know that anyone who represents rural constituency that this is probably one of the biggest issues that we face from drivers and motorists about the conditions of rural roads. I just wondering, could the minister uh, provide us with an update on her roads recovery fund? Thank you. Um, I recognise, I think we all do, that there's been historical underinvestment in our road network for a significant number of years and that many rural roads are in need of repairs. Uh, the member will know that in response to this, I allocated £12 million pounds of my 2020 21 capital budget to a roads recovery fund, and of this, £10 million pounds was specifically directed towards rural roads. This funding did allow the targeting of many short lengths of roads that were in particularly poor condition. And it is currently estimated that over 750 locations on the rural road network will have benefited from this funding. I am currently finalising my budget for 2021-22. However, I can assure the member that I remain committed to setting up a further roads recovery fund from the available 21-22 budget to continue delivering this important work to improve connectivity and to help rural communities. Um, I, thank, I want to thank the Minister for her comments, and I also want to welcome her comments as well. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the 2019 audit report indicated that fair coverage should be provided for the rural road network from the structural uh, maintenance budget. Uh, so I just want to, you know, want to raise up the Minister and also just to reaffirm her commitment to addressing that issue of potholes and the, the maintenance of rural roads, which has, has caused uh, so much havoc for motorists and as, as a serious issue for particularly those who represent the most uh, rural areas. Thank you. Yeah, and I know this is an issue that the members made multiple representations on, on behalf of his um, constituents. Um, I uh, am aware of the Northern Ireland Audit Office report and the recommendations, uh, and work has been under or work has been taken by my officials in terms of implementing those recommendations. I'm happy to provide a written update to the member on the specific recommendation that he has highlighted. I call Carl McKillen. Good can call you. Minister, could you give an update on unwanted and obstructive parking in residential areas in terms of what your department is doing? Thank you. Um, I thank the member for her question. Uh, it is really important that we ensure that our roads and our streets 
are made safe uh, for local communities and are accessible for residents. Um, my department was involved in a residence parking scheme uh, in the Rugby Road area and a review of that scheme has been undertaken and I'm discussing the findings with officials. I think there is much value in residence parking schemes. They are quite difficult at times to get agreement on, um, but certainly there's benefits to be derived and I would like to see many more of these schemes rolled out across the north. There's also the issue of enforcement for obstruction at parking as well and so traffic attendants are in place to ensure that where there is obstructive parking that fines are issued accordingly. The other area where we do a lot of work is around uh, road signs itself uh, and painting of that as well. So we try to come at this issue from uh, a number of points as well as educational in terms of advising people that they need to park responsibly and they need to park safely. Only Colin from um, I thank the Minister for that update. She will be aware that in our constituency, the Lancaster Street area um, has been subject to uh, people using it as an unwanted car park, and the residents uh, actually have had their roads, their driveways blocked, and indeed emergency vehicles. Uh, emergency services have made vehicle, or complaints about not getting access for vehicles and have had to get out on foot. Given that it's right beside the York Street interchange, and I know the Minister's position on this, but could you take this opportunity to not only assure the members who live in that, but certainly those in Henry Street, that before any work takes part on the York Street interchange, that we'll need to look at mitigations and environmental protections, including pest control, parking, all the other issues that residents need, because their quality of life at the minute has been severely disrupted at the development of the Ulster University and indeed the construction workers have used that area very carelessly for parking and some of the traffic wardens are not acquainted with the law. Thank you. Yeah, I, I am very much aware of this issue and um, I have asked for my officials to arrange for the current road markings within Lancaster Street and Thomas Street to be refreshed and also to drop a proposal for the marking of I-bar road markings at entrances at McGurk's Way, Lancaster Street and Thomas Street in advance of an informal consultation on this particular issue. Um, in respect of, and I know the member has written to me on this issue uh, as well, and I'm passing her concerns on to the Ulster University as well because of the issue with those who are involved in the construction and parking difficulties that that's presented. I also want to reassure around the York Street interchange, I accepted all of the recommendations in full, one of which was around proper consultation and engagement with stakeholders. I'm very clear that one of the key stakeholders in this uh, scheme is a local community, and I want to make sure that the York Street interchange works for those who will use the road, but also works for those who live um, around it. So they will be kept up to date, and of course, I will keep the member updated as well. The next member is not in his place, and I call Paul Frew. Can I ask the minister, given the uh, severe blockage on development in my own constituents of North Antrim, and of course, right across the province? Uh, can the Minister provide this House with an update and a resolution to the problems with NI Water? Um, the member will know that there has been, and I tend to sound like a broken record here, but I mean, it's standard um, fact that there's been historic underinvestment in our water and wastewater infrastructure, and so um, that's manifesting itself in the fact that there's over 100 locations now where we're either at or beyond developmental capacity. So it's a huge difficulty. Um, the utility regulator ha has recently ruled on the funding that's required for the next price control period. That's two billion pounds of capital investment. Of course, the difficulty here is that we're still operating from single year budgets, uh, and that is a big challenge in itself. Um, but I will continue to work with my executive colleagues to ensure that we do get the funding that is required to deliver on our water and wastewater infrastructure so that we can see the economic growth that that will deliver and also the ability then to be able to build many new homes because we're badly in need of that as well. So, Mary Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, is, is there a strategic way out of this, Minister, whereby of the 100 locations that you name, you rightly name, is there a strategic path as to what should get funding first and get development first? And would the Minister agree with me that funding in itself won't cure this issue and there may have to be another look at how NI Water is governed and functioned? 
Um, in respect of, of the member's question um, about prioritisation, there is quite a robust prioritisation process already in place. Um, so Northern Ireland Water works with the utility regulator and they work with the Northern Ireland Environment Agency as well. And so there's an assessment of uh, developmental constraints but also environmental concerns and water quality. And all of that work then leads into the prioritised list of, of investment that comes forward in the price control period. So I want to assure him that there is a robust um, process in place. In respect of going forward, the fundamental issue here is um, whether you believe that people should be charged for water or not. Uh, the position of the SDLP and the position of myself as Minister, and it's shared by executive colleagues, uh, is that people should not be paying for their water over and beyond what they're paying for in their rates. So if that is our agreed position, then we need to ensure that we give the appropriate levels of public funding to enable us to address the historic underinvestment, but also to upgrade the water and wastewater infrastructure, not just always looking at hard engineering solutions as well. And that's why the Living with Water um, programme in Belfast is really important too. And uh, members, time is up. Could please, members please take a read for a moment or two?